Are you ready to take action to attain the lifestyle of your dreams? It's a great way to make a lot of money fast, fast, fast. Hey, what's going on, Clever Investors? Cody Sperber here. Welcome back to the Clever Investor Show. And this particular episode is going to be completely different than anyone we've done in the past because I am solo today, baby. We're here in Clever Studios and uh, moving forward, we're shifting up the format of the Clever Investor Show. For the next 50 episodes, we are changing things. I believe we've done like 53 episodes or something like that up to this point. So for the next 50, we are leaning in on real estate and creative real estate investing. We're not bringing on other entrepreneurs in different industries. We're not you know, going to be doing interview topics, none of that stuff. I might interview other real estate investors or interview some of my students, uh, maybe new students, maybe students who have gone through my program and absolutely murdered it and now killing it for themselves. We might throw some of them on, but moving forward, we're talking real estate. We're all focused on financial intelligence, making money in a today's environment, in the economy that we're dealing with right now, which is looking like it's going to go into a pretty bad down market. And I think it's, my obligation, my duty to take my 20 years of experience and share it with those of you that actually want to win the money game over the next few years. It's going to be crazy out there. I'm going to have my team. Uh, Forrest will be joining us. Bryant will be joining us. Max will be joining us. Other team members of mine might be joining us, but we're going to do it kind of like just round, round table style where we're just going to be talking shop. This is what's working. These are the projects we're working on. This is how we're generating leads. This is what we're focused on. This is how we're making money. These are the losses that we're taking. These are the screw-ups that we're making. These are the blunders that we've made. Here's the wins. Here's the good moves. Here's the power moves. Here's the chess moves that we're focusing on. So starting next episode, all real estate. But to tee us off correctly, I've had a lot of you guys reach out and just ask me like, okay, Cody, what was your first year in real estate like? Like, how did you become the clever investor? How did you kind of break through? Uh, if you've listened to other podcasts where I've been interviewed, I've shared parts of this story, but today for at least the next 45 minutes or so, I want to just kind of share a little bit of my journey and my first year. You know, my first year was rough. When I hear people talking nowadays that they're struggling, like they've been doing like real estate for like three months and they haven't done a deal yet, I'm like, wow, it took me 14 months to do my first deal. What are you complaining about? When I started, there was no social media. There was no YouTube university. There was no podcast like the Clever Investor Show. It just did not exist. If I wanted to learn, I had to kind of hear things through the local community and kind of get wind of like different concepts or different topics. And then I had to go to the back of a newspaper and look for a little ad that said, real estate guru is putting on a seminar in Reno, Nevada. And I had to call a phone number and talk to a salesperson and buy a ticket and get my butt to Reno, Nevada and go to a seminar. So, you know, sometimes when I hear people saying, I haven't, I haven't got results fast enough. It's like, look, sometimes in this business, you got to be patient. It's going to come when it's going to come. As long as you're putting in the works and as long as you're increasing your skills and capabilities, as long as you're surrounding yourself with the right people and squatting up the right way, it's going to happen for you. There's no way you're going to go to a gym and grab a, a dumbbell and do this. Even if it's a five pound dumbbell, even if it's a two pound dumbbell and do this over and over and over and over, you start hitting thousands of reps, your muscles are going to get bigger. It's going to happen. So let's take a step back. Let's talk about that first moment I had ever even heard about creative real estate. Because I don't know about you guys, but like when I was a little kid, I never wanted to be a real estate investor. Like I had no successful people around me. My dad, we grew up in Mesa, Arizona. Um, we rented a plate, like my whole childhood, we rented a house. Like I, I never, we never had money. We were never like, we were in the better area of the poor side of town. You know what I'm saying? Like we, my parents did the best they could. And anything I say from this point forward is not throwing my parents under the bus. Like they were great parents. They did a great job raising me uh, and they put up with a lot. Like I was a shithead. Like I, I did all kinds of troublemaking activities um, because there was a lot of lack of supervision because my parents had to work. Both my parents have full-time jobs and they had to work. And so 
I didn't know we didn't have money. I didn't understand that because my grandparents lived in a, one of the bedrooms and I lived in the other one that we didn't have money. You know, my, and when they didn't live with us, they lived in trailer parks and we had a carport and we had, you know, a beat up pickup truck in the, in the, in the carport. Like it just is what it is. And it wasn't until later on in life that my dad finally started making any type of money until then. I think the most he ever made was like 60, 70,000 bucks a year, max 60, 65, something like that. So Growing up, I didn't have successful people around me. My dad was my mentor. My dad was the most successful person I knew. And when I remember one time when I was a little kid, I was walking down the street because I used to walk to school. Imagine that back in the day, <laughs> walking to school. I used to walk to school about two miles, two and a half miles to, to my, my grade school. And along that journey, walking down Baseline Road, there was a building. And on the side of the building, there was a guy's name. It said Polak Investments on the side of the building. And I remember looking at that building and going in my little kid head, going, how do I get my name on a building? Like, what is this building? And I pass this building every single day because my I would walk along Baseline Road and my dad would give me $1 every day to stop at the Jack in the Box and get something off the dollar menu. And that was my breakfast. And so I would, one day I stopped in the Polak investment building and I talked to the secretary and I said, excuse me, ma'am, can I speak with Michael Polak or Polak investments, whoever runs his place? Uh, I want to find out what they do. And she kind of laughed and said, you know, he's very busy. Like he doesn't just come and talk to anybody. But I said, what do you guys do? And she said, oh, we're, we're investors. We're real estate investors. And we own a lot of commercial real estate around town. And I remember that stuck with me. That was the first time the most successful guy in town that I had ever heard of was Michael Polek from Polek Investments because he had his name on a building. And I started paying attention. And sure enough, every street corner in my little area of town was owned by this dude. And uh, you can look him up. He's kind of a wild Donald Trump type of figure with crazy hair. And he used to drive around in this motor home and park in the front of these commercial properties and uh, negotiate literally parking his motorhome in the parking lot, negotiating with the owner to buy the property. Like really cool, old school, 1980s wild stuff. So anyway, that was the first seed that was ever planted about like rich people do real estate. But of course, we've all heard that. And what did, what did I do when I'm, you know, in eighth grade? Nothing, nothing with that information. I just went on about my life. And if you would have asked me what I wanted to do with my life, I would have said a history professor or a marine biologist. So anyway, fast forward, I'm now coming out of high school. I was a, a C and D student and I was lucky if I got C's. I cheated on my test. I, you know, you guys have heard my, me talk in the past. You know, I've done, done drugs, sold drugs. I was just kind of like running around with my buddies who also had a lack of supervision. So we got in all kinds of trouble. So I, I was never very, emo I wasn't a very motivated kid, but I was always a hustler. My first job with trying to make money was as a dishwasher. Um, and I was getting paid under the table. I think I was in sixth grade and I got paid as a dishwasher under the table for this little restaurant because I wanted to make enough money to buy garbage pail kids cards and a pogo ball. Like that was my motivation in life was like just to get something that I desired. So I always had that hustler spirit in me, you know, obviously selling candy. I sold candy to, as a kid to make money to get a scooter and that turned to selling weed and other illegal bag, you know, drugs. And thank God I never got caught. Some of you guys have heard my story about me talking about how I used to sell weed out of the Burger King drive through window when I turned 16 because uh, I was sick and tired of skateboarding around town, going to them. They they would come to me by going through the Burger King drive through window. And there was a special order where they would ask me to run the double Whopper with cheese through the machine two times with extra pickles, make it extra crispy. I knew that meant they wanted a quarter bag. And so I was a hustler, but I was never very ambitious. And I wasn't a very smart student. I was more street smart than book smart. Never have gotten a B or an A in my life. But you're coming out of high school and you're, you're really trying to like decide what you want to do in life. And so I went back to my dad, who's my mentor. I said, dad, what do you think I should do with my life? And he said, well, you got to start a business. You got to get a job or you got to go to college or you got to go in the military. 
And uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to go to college. And I went to Mesa Community College for about three hours. I enrolled. I went to, I believe, a biology class. I parked in the parking lot. I went to the class. I maybe made it like an hour, hour and a half. And then I packed my shit, got back in my car, and I never went back. Didn't even cancel my classes properly. I just left. And I went and uh, joined the military. You know, I, I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to do something and have some structure and have them pay me, I might as well as follow in my dad's footsteps. He was in the military in the late 60s. So I said, hey, I'm going to go go join the Navy. And that's how I ended up in the Navy. And I have, when you're in the Navy, it's a funny thing because it was the first time in my life I got motivated. It was the first time in my life I was taught to have some form of confidence to get my health on point, to care about what I look like, to care about and worry about my other team members that are around me. And while it took a severe ass kicking from them for me to finally get there, I did start to man up in the military. I hated it going through the process, but looking back now, it was the best thing I ever did. I am so grateful for that experience. I think every kid should go in the military, especially if you have ADD and you're kind of all over the place and you're not really book smart and you want to get some experience in life, go in the military. It'll be one of the best things you ever did. But while I was in the military, I experienced uh, severe seasickness. So my dreams of being a marine biologist went right out the window the first time I was ever on a Navy ship. And kind of a funny story. First time I was ever on a ship, um, when, I, when, I, when I got out of boot camp, I went to what they call sea school. And when I was in sea school, I was learning to be a quartermaster. That, that was my job was navigation. And so I was going to navigation school and they told me, if you get a, if you get first place in this school, you get the best grades in this school, you get to choose wherever the heck you want to go. You get first choice of orders out of everybody in the school. And so let's say there was 30 people in this class. I had to be number one because if I was like, I always was like a C and D student, I was going to get the last pick. And it was probably going to be like these shitty orders to be stationed someplace that you don't want to be. So I worked really hard in C school and I got to choose first because I was first place. And it was between Hawaii and San Diego. And since I was so homesick at the time, I thought, well, if you're stationed in Hawaii, which would be super epic, uh, you, you get to do all these cool things, but it's so far away from home. But if I'm stationed in San Diego, we get to go to Hawaii and that's one of the destinations you you go to a lot of the times when you're stationed on the West Coast. So I'll still see Hawaii, but I'll be able to get home to Arizona. So I chose San Diego, 32nd Street Naval Station. I got, my ship was the USS Higgins, which was a brand new guided missile destroyer, was not built yet. And so I got stationed on the Higgins. And when I showed up in San Diego, the ship was not built yet. And so I just sat around in these barracks for weeks waiting for my orders. I had no direction, didn't know what I wanted to do or what I should be doing. And I'm just stationed in San Diego waiting for somebody to tell me to do something. And then one day, somebody pops up, uh, my navigation officer, he popped up and said, hey, Sperber, uh, have you ever been out on the water yet? And I said, no. And he goes, you don't have your sea legs? And I said, no, what's that? And he goes, well, you got to go out like on a deployment. You got to be out on the water to get your sea legs. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have any sea legs. I'm from Arizona. And uh, he goes, all right, I'm going to give you some orders. Come back tomorrow. And the next day, they shipped me out to a ship called the USS Oldendorf, which was another older destroyer, not a guided missile destroyer, just a destroyer. And I was kind of like a, uh, like a guest quartermaster, a guest crewman on their ship. And so I still had to work. I was going on a six-month deployment. It was called a Westpac. And we were going to go to like 10 different countries and we were going to go to the Middle East because at the time uh, there was a flare up happening in Iraq called Desert Fox. And so they wanted us to eventually get to the Middle East to, to do whatever they needed us to do there. And of course, the first, when, we, when you're in a harbor like San Diego Harbor, uh, it's calm waters. Like when you're cruising around in the harbor, like it's not out in the open ocean, it's pretty calm. And so I'm, the ship is leaving. I had never been on a ship. I'm dressed all in my dress blues. I got, you know, I'm a seaman uh, apprentice at the time, I believe, or a seaman recruit. Like I'm brand new in the military. 
and I'm up there with the captain. I'm up there with the executive officer. I'm with, up there with the ship's navigator and all the navigation team and all the important people are up on what they call the bridge. And I'm up on the bridge and uh, the uh, executive officer and the captain say, hey, Cody, come with me. And we walk out to the outside of the bridge they called the bridge wings. And we're out there on the bridge wings and we're looking at, and we're going out in the harbor and we're looking at downtown San Diego and they're pointing out there and they're saying, Cody, look at all this. This is, this is all great. And we protect all, everything you see here. And, and the military is amazing here. They love us here. We're about to go on this amazing journey where you're going to experience different countries and different cultures. And I'm sitting there just having this conversation with them about the ship and the ship's history and the captain and his history and how long he's been in the military. And right around this time, and by the way, when you're leaving port, especially going on a Westpac, they dress the ship up. They put ribbons on the side of the ship. They put banners everywhere. It's like a celebration as you're leaving. So of course, the captain's talking to me. The executive officer's talking to me. I'm leaving the ship. I'm sorry, the port. And we get to open waters. Right in the middle of him telling me something, the ship goes up about 20, 30 feet up in this big swell and comes back down. And the captain stops talking to me and he looks at me and he goes, Cody, you okay? Instantly from that one roll, I got violently seasick. As soon as it went up again and came back down the second time, I threw up all over the executive officer's shoes. I hurled everywhere. They were like, what the fuck, Sperber? And they're pushing me out of the way. The one guy grabs me and leans me over the banister. I'm puking all over the ribbons on the side of the boat. From We, we were going to Hawaii. From San Diego Harbor all the way to Hawaii, seven days, eight days later, I threw up almost every single day up until the day right before we pulled into port. That's how violently seasick I got. So unfortunately... My dreams of being a marine biologist went right out the window. So that's gone. And I finished my military career. Best thing I ever did. Uh, great experience. Eventually got my sea legs, but still did not want a career on the water. So I'm getting out of the military. And it's crazy when you get out of the military because they just punch your card. You know, it's like getting out of prison. They just punch a hole in your card and all that structure and all that support and all that love and energy is just gone. And you're by yourself again. And so I called my dad. I said, dad, what should I do? And he said, you need to go to college. You need to get a degree in something. I highly recommend finance. But I said, dad, I really like his history. Like, I think I want to be a history professor. And he's like, well, go talk to the history professors down at San Diego State or whatever. So I go down to the local college and I go into the history department and I find a couple history professors. There was two or three of them talking. And I said, hi, my name's Cody. I just got out of the Navy thinking about being a ninth grade history teacher because when I was younger, my ninth grade history teacher made a big impact on me and I really love history. And they go, oh, that's a great career. Like, good, good for you. And I said, oh, awesome. Do you love what you do? And they were like, yeah, we love what we do. And I said, well, do you make good money? And then one of them started busting out laughing. And I was, I kind of looked at him puzzled. I'm like, why are you laughing? And he goes, well, we don't make good money. We just do this because we love it. Like, I have a second job just to pay my bills. And I remember kind of recoiling and being like, you got a second job just to pay your bills? And the other guy goes, yeah, uh, it's not about the money. If you're going to do this, you got to just, it's for the love of doing it. And I left that meeting thinking, fuck, that's, it. that's what everybody does. Everybody gets stuck in these jobs that where they don't have enough money at the end of the month. They're always struggling. They're always frustrated. Maybe you love what you do. And, and like, I'm not saying anything's wrong with being happy, loving what you do. I think that's part of life, but I don't want to be completely financially miserable, but have an okay job. And so I was really struggling with what to do. So I go back to my dad and I say, I think I'm going to go to college. And he said, get a degree in finance and emphasize in accounting because that's the language of business. If you do that, you're going to, you're going to be okay in life. So I apply at ASU. Thank God for the MGI bill. Thank God for Pale Grants because it paid for my college. And that's how I ended up back in Arizona going to Arizona State. Something funny, by the way, happens. And this is just really good for anybody listening that maybe has never gotten good grades. It's not that I was stupid. It's that I didn't like my teachers. I didn't like the topics. I didn't, I wasn't motivated to try. I was 
actually the opposite. I was motivated to try to not do it and ditch class and smoke weed and avoid traditional education because I thought it was goofy. My teachers were all like those history professors making minimum amounts of money trying to tell me how to go out there and dominate in life. Like, who are you taking advice from? This is why kids nowadays struggle so much is they have unlimited power in the palm of their hands. Chat GPT. They have all the knowledge and information in the world. The wisdom of the world is in the palm of their hands. They can make an insane amount of money through creative real estate investing, through online businesses, through e through crypto. Why the fuck are they ever going to listen to some bozo teacher that has these antiquated concepts and all they care about is you memorizing stuff? It doesn't make sense. This is why people rebel against college. They're rebelling against it being indoctrinated and in this liberal way of thinking, they're just not putting up with stuff anymore. They want to have their own ability to write their own story. And now they're empowered to do it with technology and mentorship and, and information. So I felt that way back then too. But I went to school because I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. And I thought, ah, it's good to understand and learn finance and accounting. Thank God Thank God, when I was going to school, my good friend named Jeremy asked me to go to lunch one day because that lunch meeting changed my life. It's the reason I'm sitting here before you right now having this conversation. Jeremy shows up to this lunch meeting. Now, Jeremy was a buddy of mine. We used to party. Uh, we would go to Tempe and Old Town Scottsdale and get wasted. Like we would get drunk and have fun and chase girls. And all of a sudden he's pulling up He's got a brand new outfit on and a brand new Mercedes. And I'm like, whoa, where'd you get the car? And he's like, oh, dude, I'm so excited. This is why I asked you to lunch. I flipped a house and I made $80,000. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? What do you mean you flipped a house? You don't, you're in real estate? He, what are you, a real estate agent? He goes, no, 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 I'm not a real estate agent. I flipped a house and I made 80 grand, man. It's this concept called wholesaling and there's no risk and no money involved. And I was able to make $80,000 and only took me, you know, a month's worth of work. And I'm like, what are you talking? Like it, my brain could not comprehend the concept. I thought of real estate, the old school, traditional way. You need money. You need a real estate license. You need to be in real estate. Like rich people do real estate. Broke college kids don't do real estate. And he said, dude, you just don't know yet. Nobody's turned you on to the game. Like, let me let me show you what, what's up. And he grabs a napkin and he pencils out this concept of wholesaling on a freaking napkin. And he's like, well, you're going to go find a motivated seller and you're going to put out this marketing and it's kind of like Ugg buys ugly houses and you could put out these little ads in newspapers and on Craigslist and you're going to put out these little things called bandit signs and you're going to find somebody who's motivated to sell their house quickly for cash. And then when you find them, you're going to negotiate a deal to buy their property. And when you lock up their house under a real estate contract, you gain something called equitable interest. And that means you control their real estate. You haven't bought it yet, but you control it. And then what you do next is you go out there and you go to these local RIA meetings these real estate investor meetups and you, and you put out posts on, on the internet and you try to talk to real estate agents and brokers and stuff and you try to find somebody who's looking for a good deal, an off-market deal that's not on the MLS. These people, they're cash buyers, they're landlords, they're rehabbers, they got lots of cash but very little time on their hands. And what you do is you play matchmaker and all you do is you take your discounted property that you have under contract and you serve it up to them on a silver platter and when one of them wants it, because you mark it up, a markup fee, a wholesale fee, you now are able to put this deal together. And when they actually buy the deal and close on it, you get to keep the spread or keep the difference. It's kind of like what Costco does with muffins, but you're, we're going to do it with real estate. And I'm sitting there like head spinning. It was so much information. I was like, what the fuck? okay, whatever, dude. I'm like, this, this is crazy, but good for you. And I took that napkin home with me. And it's funny because when I was in the military, my dad gave me one day, right before we went out on deployment, the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right when it came out. And I remember reading that book when we were out in the Persian Gulf. And it was the first time in my life I had ever heard of assets and liabilities. It was the second time in my life I had ever considered or thought of even about real estate. And of course, just like walking into Michael Pollack's office, I didn't do anything with that information because I was 
in the middle of the ocean in the, in the military. But now here I am staring at this napkin, getting madder and madder and madder. Why has nobody talked about this? Why don't people know this? Why don't my teachers know this? Why doesn't my dad know this? How come I've never heard about no money down house flipping before? If this is possible and this isn't a scam, why aren't more people doing it? So I got pissed. And eventually I called Jeremy back and I said, dude, either this is a scam or you're bullshitting me or this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. And he said, dude, I got another deal. It's about to close. This is totally legit. There's lots of people doing it. The guy who taught me is a mortgage guy in town. You could talk to him if you want, but like this thing's happening all over the country. And that's how I discovered wholesaling. I went and talked to the mortgage officer and he told me the way you learn this business back then. And by the way, if you want to learn this, just go to fliphousesbook.com. Download my free book. It has all this information in it in more detail. If this is exciting you and you're like, dude, I want to do wholesaling, go to fliphousesbook.com. Download. It's free for training. I have a ton of free training on my YouTube channel, at Clever Investor on YouTube. Google wholesaling. There's so much information out there nowadays. It's so easy to get started in this business. But anyways, back then he said, how you learn this is you go to a real estate seminar. I said, well, how do I find out about these things? Are there like, postings or something somewhere. And he said, yeah, in the back of newspapers. So that's how I went and got the Arizona, new, I don't know, even know what it's called anymore. The Arizona Times, the Arizona Gazette, whatever the fuck it is. And I went and got the newspaper at the 7-Eleven and I look in the back and sure, sure enough, there's a seminar put on by a guy named Al Lowry out of Canada. And uh, he was putting on a real estate seminar. And that was the first seminar I had ever gone to. And I went to all kinds of seminars. From that day forward, I spent probably twenty dollars to $30,000 flying to seminar after seminar, going to all these workshops. And by the way, I was that guy who would walk into the seminar scared to death, sitting in the very, very back. But I would love what they were saying. And these slick ass gurus would pump me up and talk to me about how we're all going to get real estate rich if we just plug into their formula and we buy their course or we buy their system or we come to their workshop or come to their boot camp. And like a young, naive, extremely motivated newbie, I was running up to the booth with my credit card in my hand, buying everything that they were selling. And I put myself into a lot of debt trying to learn this business. I don't regret, I actually, I, sh I wish I would have them here right now. I would stack them up this high. I have books and tapes and binders and CDs and, and I mean, literally tapes, like old school tapes of shit I bought. So many of our listeners reach out and they ask us how they can get involved in my actual real estate deals. Our investment firm specializes in finding deeply discounted properties, acquiring them, renovating, stabilizing both single family and multifamily properties all over the United States. That's why we're so excited to share with you clevercapitalfund.com. Now, if you have some investment capital and you want to deploy it and receive double digit returns back by real estate, then visit our website and see which fund is right for you. We have both equity funds and we have debt funds where you just get paid out every month like clockwork. All you got to do is visit www.clevercapitalfund.com today to learn more. One month, the first month, and just walk with me. If this is you, you'll get this. First month, I'm ecstatic. I'm telling everybody. I went and sat my parents down. I'm like, mom, dad, my life is about to change. Your life is about to change. I'm going to pay off your house. I'm going to retire you. I'm going to, I'm going to take you on wild vacations. I'm about to get real estate rich. There's this process called wholesaling and it's no money down. And average guys like me can go out there and make millions of dollars and I'm going to do it. And it's going to be great. And I'm going to pay for everything that we've ever desired. We're going to get cool cars. And I was just talking such a big game. I told my friends that I told my girlfriend that I was ecstatic. I had all this youthful enthusiasm and it was going to happen. I was certain of it. One month led to two. By the third month, I've now gone to five, six seminars. I bought all these books and tapes. My credit card bills were due. And you would open these things up and you would go through them. 
But it wasn't like in the seminar. It wasn't like the energy in the seminar where they made it sound so freaking easy. It was like, I'm on page 25 thinking that things go in order. Like if I just go 25 to 26 to 27, like if they just tell me what to do, like a formula, I can do it. I'm a smart enough guy that I can follow a recipe. But in real life, because there's big money involved and there's big personalities and there's real estate agents and attorneys and title officers and other wholesalers and buyers and sellers, everybody's pulling in different directions. And I was so naive and stupid. It doesn't work like the binder. It doesn't go in order. There's so many nuances in this art form. It's not technical. It's an art form, but I didn't understand it yet. And so I just kept failing. I kept struggling. And it was like, I would go back to the books, but it was like, there was these giant pieces of missing information that I couldn't put my finger on. It was kind of like these courses were Swiss cheese. So I was struggling and three months led to four and led to five. And now I'm panicking a little bit. And that little voice in my head's getting louder and louder and louder. And I'm thinking, oh fuck, can I really do this? Am I too young looking? Is this going to happen for me? Should I listen to my friends and family? Should I listen to my parents? Which who, by the way, all were talking shit behind my back now. All kind of giving me their opinions. All giving me advice. But I was struggling with it because it was like I would hear my friends say things and I'm like, why, why would I listen to you? You don't know what you're talking about. You, you've never made any significant amount of money in your life and you're giving me advice? Like, I, I don't, it just, I, it was out of alignment with where I felt like I wanted to go. But by six months, that little voice in your head's getting really, really loud. And it gets really hard to stay motivated and really hard to stay focused. And everybody's telling you, no, 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 no. The reason you're not successful is because that strategy doesn't work. What you need to do is you need to go down to the bank and you need to try to get a line of credit. Because once you have some capital, that's going to help you. No, 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 don't do that. No bank's going to lend you money. What you need to do is focus on foreclosures. And if you get a list of foreclosures and go door knock, that's going to help you find a deal. No, 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 don't do that. Send a postcard. Get a list from the title company and send a postcard. No, 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 don't do that. Go put out these little things called bandit signs all around the neighborhood. You'll get calls from that. That doesn't work. Short sales work. That doesn't work. Lease options work. That doesn't work. Uh, sub twos work. Creative finance works. Hold. It's like, fuck, man. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a strategy. But yet, everybody that I'm talking to, none of them are winning. All of us are broke jokes down at the local Rio talking out our asses. The sixth or seventh month, my parents sat me down, my hero, my dad, said, son, mom and I are really worried about you. We don't agree with what you're doing right now. We think you need to stay focused on college. Where you're getting, by the way, I was getting good grades in college. It's funny, even though I wasn't smart growing up, once I made the decision and I came out of the military to apply myself, I got straight A's all through college. Your kid's not dumb. He's just not focused. He doesn't want to do it. You can't force somebody up a mountain. But the second I made the decision, I want to feel like what it feels like to get a straight A, to get A's for an entire semester. Shit, I did it. I might as well do it for the whole year. I might as well do it for the whole degree. And I graduated top of my class, summa cum laude, because I just applied myself. And I had to work really hard. Like I was up until three in the morning every single night studying and memorizing shit. I'm horrible at math and, and I had to work really hard. I digress. The point is, my dad sat me down and said, you're making a mistake. We want you to stay focused on college. When you grow up and you get a good job and maybe you make it to Wall Street someday or you're a financial planner, once you make a lot of money, then, then you can go and buy the real estate. And I remember being so mad leaving that meeting, so defeated because the people that love me the most are the ones that are trying to talk me out of my dreams. We've all been there. You might have experienced something similar. And if you haven't, it might be just right around the corner. Because it's not that my dad didn't want me to be successful. He wanted me to be successful. He's given me some of my best advice. It's that they love you and they want to protect you. And so I really struggled for the next two, three weeks. I mentally was broken down and just beat up. And I think I tried to quit or wanted to quit a hundred times. 
But then I finally, around the ninth month, finagled a deal together. And I was so excited about this deal. And I was only going to make a few thousand bucks. I was just pairing a couple other people together, but I finagled this deal together. And at the last minute, I remember one of the people in the deal said, Cody, there's too many hands in the pot on this deal. We don't want to put you on the HUD statement. We will pay you outside of closing your few thousand bucks for putting the deal together. And I said, well, everything I was taught was to not do that. I don't want to get screwed on this deal. Like I really would feel more comfortable being on the HUD. And they said, look, it's just the deal will fall apart if you go on the HUD. Like you got to be paid outside of escrow. Reluctantly, naively, I said, okay, I guess if that's the best thing for you guys and for the deal. Sure enough, the real estate agent in the deal and the other, the buyer, once the deal closed, they instantly got amnesia. When I came around asking for the money, they said, oh yeah, yeah, we'll get to you. We'll get to you. Week later, they started ducking my phone calls. Then they forgot what they said to me. And next thing you know, they told me, hey, look, we're not giving you any money. Sorry, go find another deal. You're out. And they fucked me out of the deal. And I remembered the injustice in it, the anger in it. I was so fucking fed up. I was so mad at this point. Nine months, no deals, everybody talking shit, out of money, $30,000 in credit card debt, just angry. So I quit. I threw in the towel and I said, fuck wholesaling, fuck real estate. I'm not doing this anymore. At the same time, my girl was telling me that I needed to go get a job so I can pay for our credit card bills or my credit card bills. That day I went and I got, uh, I was at ASU and there was a job posting on a bulletin board that said bookkeeper wanted. And I called the guy and I said, hey, I'm interested in your job. I'm Cody. I'm taking some accounting classes at ASU and I'm a finance major. I think I'd be good for this job. And the only reason I called this job is because it was a real estate developer that needed a bookkeeper. And so I talked to a guy, his name was Jer, and he said, come on down and uh, uh, we'll have a meeting and see if you're right for the job. And I showed up in downtown Phoenix and I this guy, Jer, was there and he's this big, overweight, heavy set guy dressed in a fancy suit up in a high rise tower with this fancy office. And he was making a fortune. He was just killing it as a real estate developer. And he said, you ever don't done books before? And I lied. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know how to do books. And he said, okay, well, I desperately need a bookkeeper. Mine quit. I'll pay you $34,000 a year. And I said, hmm. I really need like 38. That's like the going rate for book. He said, look, kid, if you want the job, it's 34. If not, goodbye. I said, no, 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 I'll take it. Left that meeting, went immediately to the bookstore, bought bookkeeping for dummies, read it all weekend long, showed up Monday as a bookkeeper for this guy. And I'm doing his books. And what happens when you do books? You see the money, the money coming in, the money going out. This guy was making millions of dollars renovating historic properties in downtown Phoenix. But he didn't have one project going on at a time. He had like 40. And he was playing the game at a pretty high level. And it was like, I'm just sitting there scratching my head because I'm watching this guy. He's a doofus. This guy's not only an asshole, he's a doofus. He makes the weirdest biz like decisions. He's mean to everybody, but he's killing it in real estate. And it just pissed me off because I'm like, Oh my God, I'm a good guy. I'm trying my hardest. I'm, I feel like I'm pretty smart and I couldn't even finagle a deal together in nine months. And this guy's murdering it, doing 40 at a time, making tens of millions of bucks. So anyway, my bookkeeping job lasted about three, four months before a good friend of mine named Zach Bali came up to me and said, Cody, I want to take you to a real estate seminar in San Francisco, put on by a guy named Jack Miller. And I said, Zach, I'm cutting you off. I am not going to a real estate seminar. I've been to uh, dozens of real estate seminars. I'm broke because of real estate seminars. I quit the real estate business. I am a bookkeeper and going to college. And uh, I'm not going. It's just not happening. He said, Cody, this will be different. I promise. And for weeks, he tried to get me to go to this real estate seminar put on by Jack Miller. After about three weeks of him fighting me, trying to get me to go, finally, he said the magic words that got 
to convince me to go. And he said, Cody, I just want to let you know, this is my last time asking you, but you have to go to this seminar with me. In fact, I will pay for the cost of the seminar. If you don't get there and think it's the greatest thing that ever happened to you in your, in your life, if you don't feel like it's different than any seminar I've ever brought you to, if this isn't epic, then I'll pay for every dollar of the trip. Just think of it like a vacation with your boy, Zach. And my girl at the time said, I think you should go. I said, okay, Zach, I'm in. And the next weekend we shipped off to San Francisco. We walked into a room. There was about 500 attendees in this room. A guy named Jack Miller was standing up at the podium. There was no fancy screens. There was no slick sales pitch. There was no selling whatsoever. It was just a bunch of old real estate guys talking real estate, talking deal flow. I walked into that room, I'm telling you, I knew instantly that this was different. I knew instantly. In fact, you ever been in a place where the arm hairs stand up and your neck hairs stand up and you feel like that ice cold feeling like, wow. It's like someone's breathing down, like in the, like whispering something on the back of your ear. I was just like, whoa. And I'm looking out and there's Al Lowry and there's Ron Legrand and there's the other guy I bought courses from sitting in the audience frantically taking notes from Jack Miller. I'm like, wow, he's the guru's guru. This is cool. And I instantly fell in love because it was just a community of people that have been together for 10, 15, 20 years doing real estate deals together, being together, community building together, deal making together, learning together. And I knew it was different. Anyways, to, we've now been going about 40 minutes. I'm going to wind this story down. At that lunch break, I go to lunch and I'm sitting at the bar and I ordered my food and I'm sitting there and sitting next to me is this old man. His name is Lyle Wall. This old man is sitting there and he looks kind of crazy, like a crazy Yoda. He's got a wrinkly polo shirt tucked into Adidas sweatpants, pulled up to his nipples with these big old man Velcro New Balance shoes. And he's sitting there and he's kind of kicked back. He's kind of got his foot up and he's at the bar maybe eating food or ordering his food or whatever, waiting for his food. And I happen to just come up next to him. And so we start talking. And it was the greatest conversation I had ever had in my life about real estate and wealth building and financial intelligence and creative real estate investing. And 20 minutes in, I'm in all of, the, all of this guy. I couldn't believe how wise he was and how good at real estate he was. And he had been in the Jack Miller community for over 20 years. He comes to every event. He's part of the Jack Miller inner circle. And I'm like, wow, you are the smartest real estate investor I had ever met. He did everything inside his self-directed Roth IRA, had like $20 million that he built in his tax-free Roth IRA, all buying, owning, and flipping real estate. He was so brilliant at the financial engineering uh, of the way he made money. He used to own a bank, actually. He was a very smart guy. And about 35, 40 minutes in, I looked at him and I cut him off in mid-sentence. And I said, Lyle, I don't even know why I'm saying this. I've never said this to anybody, but you got to be my mentor. You got to be my mentor. And he started laughing. He said, oh, Cody, you're crazy. I'm not going to be your mentor. Like, you're not, you know, you don't want me to be your mentor. And I said, no, Lyle, I really want you to be my mentor. Like, you got to do this with me. And he said, Cody, you're not willing to do whatever it takes to to be one of my students. Like, I don't take on students. Like, I'm pretty rough. Like, I'm hardcore. Like, you don't want to be my student. I said, Lyle, I'm willing to do literally whatever it takes. I tried and I failed. I, I, I just told you my experience and how I'm now this bookkeeper and I hate my job. Like, you're the guy. You're what the missing link. You're what I've been missing. You got to mentor me. I'll do whatever it takes. He said, you're not going to do whatever it takes, Cody. I already know it. Most people aren't. Most people don't succeed in real estate. If I lined up a hundred people right now, two of them will go out and do a deal. Everybody says they want it, but most people won't put in the work for a long enough period of time to get the results. They're just mentally weak. I said, not me. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. He said, you're willing to do whatever it takes. I said, whatever it takes. Are he said, you sure about that? I said, fuck Lyle. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Let's go, baby. He said, okay, let's see. You like, uh, you like baseball? And I said, eh, I don't know. 
It's okay. I used to play baseball as a kid. Like I'm not much of a sports guy. He said, well, I love baseball. I always think about the way I talk and like baseball analogies. He said, so first off, there are three rules when working with me. Rule number one is that you got to show up tomorrow with $10,000 in $5 bills. That's your cost of entry for me being your mentor. I said, okay, where the fuck am I going to get $5 bills? He said, not my problem. Figure it out. He said, rule number two, like baseball, there are three strikes when working with me. Three strikes and three strikes only. If you say something I don't like, if you don't do what I tell you to do, if you talk back, if you're negative and toxic, if you rub me the wrong way, if I'm just having a fucking bad day and I just want to check you, I'm giving you a strike. The third strike, I fire you immediately as being my mentee. I will take the $10,000 that you gave me. I will block your phone number and never talk to you again. I was like, damn. Okay, that's hardcore. And I was like, kind of like joking. I'm like, okay, well, what's rule number three? He said, rule number three is simple. If we're going to work together and I know you're going to go out there and get rich. For your first deal, you get to keep on your first big deal, you get to keep 100% of the profits. But from that day forward, every single time we work together, if I'm involved in any way, shape or form as your mentor in your life, I get to choose for every deal that you do, how much of that deal I keep and how much of that deal you get. So you make 10,000 bucks, I might give you all 10,000, I might give you 50 bucks and keep the rest. And I'm thinking, damn, that's hardcore. So let me get this straight. I know my personality. I'm gonna break the rules. I'm going to get three strikes. You're going to fire me. I don't even know where I'm gonna get $10,000. And you're just gonna take whatever you want out of every deal we do forever? He said, yeah, you said whatever it takes. How bad you want it? Let me ask you something. What would you do in that moment? Would you take the deal? I mean, obviously, you know the outcome. I'm sitting in front of you. I've done thousands of deals. I made over $100 million in real estate. Like, you know the outcome. Obviously, I took the deal, but what would you do in that moment? So of course, I figured out a way to get the money and I did, I got the money. And it's funny when people, when I'm talking to my mentoring students or somebody who's thinking about mentoring and they DM me and they say, Cody, I want you to mentor me. And I go, yeah, it's, uh, it's 10,000 bucks. It's 50,000 bucks. It's a hundred thousand bucks, depending on what we're doing. And they go, I don't know how I'm going to come up with that money. And I say the same thing Lyle said to me, look, that's not my problem. Go figure it out. Because I'm telling you what, right now, if I take somebody who's motivated, like a drug addict, and I drop them blindfolded into any city in the middle of America that they've never been to before, I bet you any amount of money, that person will find drugs and find a way to get the drugs. When they're fiending enough, they will find a way. That's real desire, real motivation. They're willing to do whatever it takes. So what are you talking to me about? You don't have the money. Figure it out. So anyways, I took the deal and, uh, you know, I tried so hard to do this on my own with all my pride and all my ego. I tried to do it on my own. And within two months of working with Lyle, I landed my first big deal and it was a massive deal and it was a tough deal. It was a foreclosure, a bankruptcy and a divorce. And without Lyle in my corner, there's no way I would have been able to pull that deal together. And I ended up making $40,000 on that deal. I want you to think about that for a second. In about two weeks worth of time, having no clue how a bankruptcy works, a foreclosure works, divorce work, none of that shit. I'm a new real estate investor. I have never done a deal. And that's a whole story for another podcast of how I pulled that deal together. But I had never done a deal, but with Lyle's help, I pulled it off and I made 40 Gs. More money than I make as an entire year wearing fucking khaki pants and a stupid polo sitting at a cubicle dealing with an asshole boss that doesn't respect you while going to school full time, making 34 grand a year. And in two weeks, I made more than a full time person. It was that day I realized the power of mentorship. It was that day I quit my job and I went into real estate full time and I never looked back. It was that day I realized that my relationship with money was broken. And I was thinking about money really wrong. And I needed to spend the next year of my life studying how money works, studying how rich people think about money 
and the psychology of money. Thank God I made some of the choices I made. Thank God Zach Bali asked me to go to one more seminar. Thank God my dad sat me down and pissed me off just enough by telling me to quit that it made me unquit and say to myself, I don't want to be like you. I don't want to trade places with you. I'm not going to listen to anybody giving me advice, no matter who you are. Unless you're fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger, don't give me health advice. Unless you're Elon, uh, Elon Musk, don't give me tech advice, rocket advice, or money advice. I'm not getting relationship advice from my single friends. I'm just not going to do it, and neither should you. So I'm going to end this podcast by saying, yeah, my first year was rough. It was really rough, but I'm not here because I'm smarter than normal people or I have special talent. I'm not talking to you on this podcast because I got lucky or I grew up in the right family or I'm the right gender or the right skin color or right whatever. It was a battle, my battle. My, my race was my race and it was tough from my perspective the whole way. And you are dealing with your own challenges. But I'm not up here because I'm so great and I overcame everything and I'm so tough and smart. No. I'm up here because great people like Lyle Wall locked arms with me one day and said, all right, let's go. If you want this bad enough, I'll show you the path. This is a team sport, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm grateful right now that I have an amazing team at Green Elephant Development, a great, amazing team at my wholesaling business, Sell Quick for Cash, and National Property Superstore. And I'm going to be bringing them in on future podcasts to work with you guys for the next 50 episodes. No more fucking interviews. No more playing small. We're going into a down market. The economy is in a really tough spot right now. There's going to be a lot of people financially hurting. There's going to be a lot of people running out of runway. All-time high credit card debt, all-time high student, debt, uh, student loan debt, Poor leadership at the top. We can't trust these politicians. You know, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle they're on. They're all idiots. They're all selfish. They, they're they spending money with no repercussions. Like it's our children that will face the debt that they're putting us under. And while we can't control the gas prices and the overarching economy that we're all operating in, we can control our little economies. And my job over the next 50 episodes is to help you build a financial wall around you and your family to protect you from this nonsense, to help you on the personal development side of things, to get you in the right mindset and right relationship with money and the right mental space so you can go out there and win this game in a down market. And I'm going to bring my best team members to help you do it. So I hope that you stick around with us. I hope that you uh, save this podcast and, and put notifications on. I hope that you do things like leave reviews so we can turn other people on to this podcast. I hope that you share this with friends that are maybe struggling, that need a little bit of encouragement, that you are three feet from gold. You're right there, baby. Just do not quit. Do not change directions. Real estate's a great vehicle to be in. It's a great tax efficient vehicle. It's a great money making vehicle. You got to be in this vehicle. And I want to help you dominate over the next few years by being in the right place at the right time with the right people. So I appreciate you for listening. Thank you. Uh, fliphousesbook.com was the uh, free wholesale training that I gave away on this episode. Um, if you have money that you're looking to uh, lend out, you got a bunch of lazy money laying around. My development company is always looking to raise capital. If you're an accredited investor, go to clevercapitalfund.com and uh, look at all the different projects we have going on. We got a lot of big commercial projects that we're working on right now that we're very excited about. We'll talk about in future episodes. And until next time, we're out of here. Take care, comb your hair. We'll see you later. Peace. Hey, Cody Sperber, the original Clever Investor, host of the Clever Investor Show podcast, and I'm shooting this ad right now to let you know that this podcast exists. It's finally out, and we have some amazing guests. So please, I'm begging you, can you just come and give our podcast a listen? I've been doing real estate for a really long time. I've accessed some of the coolest people in the world. We were having all these amazing conversations, and I'm like, what are we doing? Let's record this and actually put it out on a podcast. But the problem is, I have to let people know about it. That's where this ad comes in and this is where you come in. 
You're gonna be able to learn from successful entrepreneurs, get in-depth interviews from amazing leading experts. You're gonna learn real estate investing strategies and tactical training strategies that work in today's market. We're going over market analysis and different market predictions. You're gonna be able to engage in an awesome community. And we go into some pretty deep dives on the mindset of what it takes to win the game of money and in life, plus lots of bonus resources and exclusive content. So what you're gonna to wanna to do right now is click the link that you see on your screen and give the show a subscribe today. We have amazing guests like Ken McElroy and Robert Kiyosaki and Wes Watson and Pace Morby and Jamil Damji and Vina Jetty and a whole host of amazing men and women entrepreneurs that you're gonna to love to learn from and get to know. So what you wanna do right now is click that link and give the show a subscribe today.